All right. Woo! DrupalCon! DrupalCon! All right. Uh, very happy to be here. I want to quick uh, thank all the organizers, all the people putting all this together. They're amazing. This is an incredible event. I love it. Thank all of you for coming. I appreciate it. I prepared for you a brand new talk. Brand new. First time I've ever given it. Considerations. Thank you. Considerations of Federated Search. My name is Adam Bergstein. I go by Nerdstein. This is a live action shot of me at a beach just, you know, maybe a couple days ago, right? The real thing. I am uh, the Vice President of Engineering. I work for Hook42. We are an awesome company uh, out of the Bay Area. I live in Pennsylvania, personally. Uh, we have a great team. We do a lot of good services. Here's my information. I go by Nerdstein on Drupal.org. Uh, Nerdstein with a three on Twitter. Someone squatted my brand. Not cool, right? Okay. So that's how you can reach me. So about this talk, let's have a, a brief conversation. First, we're going to look at some basic concepts of what we're talking about. Then we're going to review search backends. We're going to look at some data transmission. How does that happen? Uh, search features for you to be mindful of when you're evaluating solutions. Uh, let's look at interfaces. And then we'll sum it up. Some basic concepts. All right, so how do we define Federated search. How do we do that? What is the key thing that, is, uh, that we're talking about? Information retrieval that allows for simultaneous, that's the key word in that sentence, search of multiple searchable resources. Okay? So what do you really want? You want something like that. You want Google. Right? I want to type something in. I want to be able to search a bunch of different things. I want to be able to pull something up. I want it to be relevant. Right? All of those things. So that's going to be our analogy for the day as we walk through this story. Right? But what can your sources be? What are the things that you really you know, want to try to get or grab? In this context, we're at DrupalCon. Right? So we're going to be looking at websites. And it could be anything. It could be raw HTML. It could be generated with Gatsby. Uh, it could be any of that stuff. It could be a Drupal site. Heck, it could even be WordPress. I said it. Um, so what, what's a real key thing to, to be mindful of as we're looking at these data sources? What are stuff that we need to kind of frame our reference? Well, let's look at like availability. That's kind of a key concept, right? So this data needs to be available to access so that we can get it to be searchable, right? So data basically can be anywhere. We can get you know, data from any site. It could be over, you know, over here, over there. Uh, but we need to make sure that that data is readily available to, to be searched, right? Another key concept to be mindful of is data formats, right? So we need to be looking at things in a standard, kind of uniform and conventional way. And if we don't, then we're going to get off the reservation, right? We, we, we can't scale. We can't support every unique thing that happens on every single website. So we're looking at generic things, generic tools and practices and standards that we can use across the board so that we are successful. Right? Another key concept to be mindful of is how often do you want that data to be refreshed? Right? How, how quickly you know, is it? Do you want it daily? Do you want it every 15 minutes? And what kind of scale are you looking at? Right? So if you're doing that across two or 3,000 websites, right, then you start getting into some complication there. So this is a good thing to be mindful of as you're looking at. All right. Let's dive right into the next section, which is about search back ends. Who's familiar with the term backend? I just want to make sure that I'm, OK, cool. All right. The first thing to really understand about a search backend is you need some uniformity. We've talked about this, right? So we need a shared schema, right? If you're going and looking at multiple websites and you're trying to get elements, you need to understand what it is that you are getting from those sites, from those sources. So you need to agree on a shared definition that is standard across all of those sources, right? And then those, that definition should have the associated uh, fields, we could call them, right, and data types. So this thing, I'm expecting like a shorter string, or this thing is a big block of HTML, or maybe this thing is an image, right? So these are the different ways or different fields that you could look to set up or establish, but it's really relevant to whatever it is you're searching. Uh, and also don't forget about cardinality, right, because HTML can have more than one heading on a page, as an example, right? It's kind of important. And these fields end up, ending, uh, end up getting stored within an index. And that is really like the analogy is a non-relational table, right? So you have 
relational databases that you can link to things. It's not. It's flat. Like it's a big, big epic, big data table, right? So here's a kind of a good analogy to, to frame this, uh, a good visual that I thought might communicate this well. You know, so if we're going and we're scouring our sources, you might have a title on the page, you might have a uh, H1 and H2 or a body tag, right? And those things kind of map to some other, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, so that's a schema. So this would be our fields within the schema. So we're gonna say, I want to get a table, I want to get all the H1s, I want to get the H2s, and then the, uh, the field types and everything are on the right side, if I'm framing that right. So we have text, uh, this, that one's a list of text, and a list, and that one might be long text, right? So that gives you just kind of some example of how to set up the schema and the fields. Make sense? Cool. All right, so what are some platforms that are, are kind of known for this sort of thing? Well, you have Elasticsearch. That one's really up and coming. It's pretty cool. It's got a lot of advanced features. Uh, Solar is kind of the conventional go-to, stable, uh, been around a while. And Algolia is more of a platform as a service kind of thing that is really up and coming and is pretty exciting too and they're doing some good things, very similar to Elastic. All right, so what are some considerations of these platforms as you're evaluating what you need to do for your search backend? I think the most important thing today and right now is APIs and interoperability. If you don't have a good API to work from when you're working with a search backend, it, you're, you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot. It will not scale. Uh, the next thing is uh, I've seen features around data types, uh, especially for Elasticsearch, they have things called semantic data types like geolocation, IP addresses, and if you have semantic data types, that gives you all these incredible features uh, right at your fingertips, like robust querying, uh, reporting, graphing, charting through Kibana, like that kind of stuff is really, really amazing. Chris is a super expert in that. Um, so uh, definitely look at the data types as you're going through and evaluating these platforms. And it's gonna have to have all the basics, right? You still need querying, you still need filtering and functions that you can run so you can do some advanced calculations and summarize the data that you need. And don't forget about environments, right? This is like the classic thing, you know? So you have your local system and you have development servers and then you have production. You should have the same thing for your search backend, right? Don't be putting it all on production, that's really risky. All right, cool, so far so good? Everybody hanging in? All right, amazing. Data transformation, let's look at that, okay. Who's familiar with the Migrate framework in Drupal, right? A lot of folks, cool, same thing. ETL framework, extract, transform, and load. We're doing the exact same thing. This is how you can model what the data transmission looks like in any federated search solution. Because you have to get the data in there, right? And we'll talk about how to do that. So first, we're gonna extract all the information from the various sources, and it could come from anywhere, right? We're gonna do some sort of transformation, right? We probably, normalize the data some, maybe, you know, we have to do some sort of transformation. I've never had a solution that hasn't. You know, we have to process each field, make sure it's the correct data type, et cetera. And then we're gonna load it in to the actual index itself, right? We're gonna store it. All right, so this, this is cool. So I took Umami uh, and did a little screenshot to try to communicate the idea of the fields and the, the idea of getting the elements off of the page as you're doing this data transformation. So again, this is the Umami, uh, the out of the box initiative in Drupal. And so you can see like, I grabbed a recipe, right? Uh, and that is like one of the titles, right? So that's, the, that's a source page, and that's the field that I wanna get from the page, and I'm putting it into the index, into the title of the index itself. Same here, so here's an H2 on the page, and there's a body, and that goes into my headings field in the index, right? Body goes into the contents field. So that's kind of how that ETL sort of works. Now, I didn't really cover any of the processing, but that's the general idea. So we're gonna extract these things from the page and put it where we need it inside of our search index. Make sense? All right. Now here's the example of the processor, right? So I have a body field and it's markup. It's got a bunch of stuff in it. It's got punctuation. It's got a whole bunch of HTML tags, right? But maybe all I want is the actual content. I want the words, right? If someone's searching on something, I want to make sure I'm getting the right words. So what I might do is I'm going to grab that body value, and as part of the transformation, I'm going to remove the tags, right? I'm going to strip them out, and then I'm going to ship it to the search index. So this is really the ETL process for one of the fields that's going on. Cool? Cool. 
didn't get the diagrams in there, I apologize. So there are two ways that you can actually extract data. The first way is you could crawl a site. That's what Google does, right? So you could pull data from multiple sources. You define the sources that you want, and then you crawl them in a consistent and uniform way. And that can handle your ETL, right? As part of the crawling, you could do the transformation at the exact same time, and then store it as you're crawling it, right? The other way is if you actually push data to the search index directly from the source. So for those familiar with the Drupal stuff, right, we have Search API. Search API has the Elastic Connector module or Apache Solar modules, and it can interact directly with an index, but that index could be receiving data from multiple sources, right? It's pushing it up. So you could have multiple Drupal sites pushing information. So that's a good way to, to frame how you want to perform the data transmission. Uh, I will say uh, that with the crawler, uh, you have to be mindful of the fact that you are doing things in a, an extremely predictable and rigid way every single time, right? I would not recommend putting in site-specific logic inside of a crawler. That would get really, really hairy really quick. Uh, we uh, built a crawler using the Scrapey framework, which is in the Python ecosystem. But you have access to all those really cool Python plugins and modules that, like, right at your fingertips, right? So lots of like ne uh, natural language processing and data normalization tools that are right there, right in your grasp. Super easy to use. It's a great framework. We we really liked it. And then you know you're going to run that and you're going to spider your sites and get all the information that you need. And so you do need to be mindful though. The Scrapey framework is really cool. It, it provides some out of the box uh, extraction logic. So for those that are familiar with like CSS selectors, you can get elements of the page, grab the information, or you can use XPath, something like that. But you need some way to be able to query what is on the page, right? I want the body tag, or I want this heading with this class, or something like that, right? Um, and so there's some really nice stuff too, especially for Drupal with the nat uh, natural language processing that you could work very well with multilingual as an example. So that's another big consideration is the language. Yeah, and then uh, Scrapey was cool because it has a whole bunch of plugins for source storage. So like if I wanted to use Elastic, it had a plugin. If I wanted to use Solar, it had a plugin. I could write it to a data file, that would work too. You know, but it can do a lot of different, uh, different things. The source API is really, uh, I think the great way to frame this, the model is every source is responsible for performing its own transaction, right? And it has to conform to what the central index is doing right, and the data types and the fields. And so this often ends up being that you have to have custom logic per site, and you have to write all the processing, and then you have to perform the mapping from my elements on my page to what is in the index itself. So you almost have to do like what the migrate tool is doing if you go this approach, right? Uh, but the, the benefit is you can really refine or very uniquely specify what you want to send per site, which is advantageous in some cases. And we did talk about this with the search API and the indexes and processors. Cool. So far, so good? We're, we're blazing, all right? We're blazing. All right, search features. Again, let's level set. We're trying to do this, OK? We are trying to do this. That is what people want. All right. So I love that image. It's a little blurry, but I think you'll get the point. Semantics. Semantics is everything when looking at search features. This is like the biggest like aha moment, right? So when someone searches for something, right, if they type in the word fly, do they want a bug or are they going on an airplane, right? If they do bat, are they talking about an animal or are they talking about a device to hit a ball? No one knows, right? This is very confusing. So search terms can actually have various meanings. Meaning is the key. The semantics are really valuable to understand in this context. So how can we try to like extend this a bit more? A lot of search uh, features, uh, they consider this idea called tokenizing, right? And you could split up what is searched and try to understand it better in more context. So if you split up this input into specific terms, someone might type fly on a plane. Right? And then you have a specific semantic, right? Or they say, fly on a wall. And that's implying a bug, right? 
So having uh, those tokens to split up the different words can help you to achieve that semantics that we are looking to achieve. Another thing that you can do as part of search uh, is really stripping out stop words. And these are words that I, you know, maybe they just don't really add value to the semantics. They don't have any real meaning. So if someone types in of or the or my, it's not really getting you anywhere. It's not adding any value to what is in the search index, right? It's like a dead word, right? And so they call those stop words. And stop words are really critical because they don't add to the semantics, right? So you can basically strip them out. The other thing to be kind of mindful of about, around semantics is the idea of synonyms. So a lot of uh, search backends, uh, search uh, platforms have support for things like synonyms, right? Where uh, you might search for car, but you know maybe someone wants auto or maybe someone wants vehicle. They're all kind of the same idea, right? So like if you go through and you're searching for car, maybe you do want it to allow to search for auto, or maybe you give someone a suggestion and say like, hey, did you want to search for auto as well? Something like that. So having those kinds of features can be really useful for the actual experience that someone might want when searching. Stemming is also really cool in terms of trying to drive semantics, right? Because uh, say someone looks for study, right? But they type studying or studies. These are the same thing. They mean the same exact thing, right? So you could take the stem of the word and try to search for that, right? And there's tools to do that within some of these uh, search you know, platforms. So that's really, really helpful because then you're driving towards the semantics, right? You're actually getting what you want from a search, you know, even if they use just slightly the, a different variation of it, right? So that can be really helpful. Uh, lemmatizing, it's basically the same idea, except it's not starting with the stem of the word, it's the variations of the same word. So grow, grew, grown, right? If you in the back end, semantically, it basically is all the same form of grow. So you could understand that semantically you could look for that. All right, everybody's favorite, right? Spell checkers. You know, I mistyped my name, going to Google, and I really like the idea of having the did you mean, the suggestion engine, right? So these are also features that sometimes come out of the box with some of these search back ends and search platforms. So you might want that. It's a good consideration, right? Uh, I mean, I fat finger things all the time. I want it. OK, so now we're getting into a little bit more of the you know, kind of science here. A lot of these search platforms have uh, specific ways to perform algorithms. Most of it comes through the querying engine. But there is a lot of things here that you need to be mindful of, right? So the key thing is relevance, right? And if you're crawling multiple things and you're storing multiple fields per you know, scrape of a, of a page, and you're putting that into like my title field and my body and my headings, you kind of need a way to say, you know what, I want these headings to, to have more weight, to more, more value, more relevance than, say, the general contents, right? Because headers are usually pretty important, especially for screen readers and these other things. And so naturally, we need a way to be able to say, well, I want this algorithm to make this field a little better, a little stronger, give it a heavier weight than this other field over here, right? And so uh, what, this, what the outcome of this is, is basically trying to define the sort order of what the, the matching results are returned. So I'm going to get them in a very specific uh, way, in a very specific order. And that usually, uh, if you see the, the terms weighting or boosting, that is usually the terminology that is used to help with this algorithm. And there are a lot of different uh, features and things to be mindful of that can be a part of your algorithm on your site. The other idea is filters and facets, OK? So if you have this field index uh, split up by titles and headings and bodies, right? Maybe you want to very specifically filter based on one of those fields. That is a very relevant use case, right? So someone can do the Google and type in men's Merrill hiking shoes, right? And they'll just go and it'll get lemmatized and tokenized and try to get exactly what you want, right? Or maybe someone is shopping on a shoe website and on the left side is a facet 
that says, oh, okay, I'm going to start, I want men's. Boom, I pick that. All right, next, I'm going to pick hiking. Boom, I pick that. Oh, and all right, I see Merrill. Boom, I pick that. They want to drill down because they know exactly what they want, right? So that's the idea of filters and facets. So uh, if you go, you want to make sure that uh, any search platform that you select is definitely capable of doing uh, queries and this kind of uh, feature set. And they pr primarily do. All right, are we hanging in? I'm blazing, I'll tell you. Search interfaces, this is a very fast talk. All right. There's really two primary ways to build a search interface in my experience. Uh, the first way is what I would call integrated, okay? And integrated is kind of the same idea of like, I have a site and it's pushing data in my index. This integrated approach is basically putting in a uh, feature on your website specifically that pulls information from the search index, right? So in this case, this is exactly what like the search API is doing uh, to get and retrieve information or views, right? It's a Drupal specific solution, right? And so you can look at that as kind of either the CMS doing its work or whatever framework you're using, uh, but you're building it specifically for the site, right? You're actually building an interface directly into your Drupal site that is working. And you still do need to be mindful of the fact that you have to be able to generate queries. You have uh, the ability to process very specific records though, which is kind of cool, right? So you can really finely tailor the experience that you want site by site if you're using this kind of an approach, right? It's just like doing custom coding, right? So that's nice and all, but it's not really for everybody. And we're talking about uh, scenarios, right, where we're scanning and crawling thousands of sites, right? But what about a solution where we could look to have an, uh, an interface that can work on all thousand, uh, all of those sites, all 2,000, 3,000 of them, right? Let's look at that, all right? In that case, that would be more of a decoupled solution, right? You've heard a lot about React, I'm sure. It's been discussed, I think, a good bit. So that's one framework, Vue.js. So you pick your modern JavaScript framework of choice, of Dujo, right? soup of the day, and you get, uh, you can build something that is agnostic to the uh, site that you're plopping that on, right? And that's, you know, going to be rendered through HTML, it's going to be rendered client side, or uh, built client side, right? So you don't really have to worry about all the site specific stuff. Now what you do need to worry about though is how you consume that. You have to have an endpoint, right? So you can either do that directly to your Elastic endpoint. I don't usually recommend that. Uh, I feel like you should have some proxy as sort of a security layer, like a best practice, right? Uh, and that might be one other server, you know? But we're talking something still central that, is, that can be put into any of the websites. And the great thing about this approach, too, is you can still theme it in whatever way you want. Every, every site can still have its own CSS, but you're going to keep the JavaScript the same, and you're going to render it the same way, and you're going to hit the endpoint the same. All the logic is there, it just never changes, right? Uh, and the other good thing about it is this is really highly performant because you know, you're pushing all that logic off to, uh, off to the client. So you're not gonna slow down your backend processes of the site, you're not gonna have to really worry about anything for the site, you're gonna push it all, right? Which is kinda cool. And so you can really share the same exact artifact, the same you know, app in as many sites as you want. Pretty slick, right? We made it. Not bad. About seven minutes. Any questions? Uh, can you come to the mic? It's on my instructions. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, this architecture that you actually describe it here is kind of interesting. And I'm thinking about implementing something very similar. Okay. So you're basically saying many Drupal sites and then you have a back end and it's kind of pulling all this information. Right. And then you search on any of the sites mm -hmm. and it's returning the search results on specific place. So you're not, you're not really going to a third right. server. Correct. Um, is that models that has already been done to accomplish this? Is this something that? Absolutely. 
this already a recipe? Oh, uh, you mean is there like uh, some code available to do this or uh, anything Steps. like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the uh, there is. I think uh, so. To repeat the question, uh, is there what are some of the the tools that can get this from end to end to just you know probably build it right? Um, I mean, I think quite honestly, that's really where you're looking at like a SaaS solution. So like Elastic has uh, something called Swift Type where you can just go and pay for it and it has its own crawler and do things. In terms of something open source, I'm not 100% sure. Like, I mean, Elastic itself is open source, so is uh, Solar. Uh, so you could like stand them up and have, you, you know, parts of the solution. But I think that uh, if you're looking at something like Scrapey, it's extremely flexible, like it's a framework. So you still need to build in that logic. You still need to create your index. And I think that's the piece that probably is going to take a bit of time. Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, nothing comes to mind of something that you, know, you could just install quickly and kind of run with it. Uh, but I, that's, that's certainly something I think to, to look at you know, in the future. Yes? Uh, so you're talking about Scrapey. Can you tell us like any specific uh, features that you have used for Scrapey? Oh, I could be here all day. Um, <laughs> Where do I start? Uh, so uh, part of it is not just Scrapey. Part of it is the whole Python ecosystem, right? So we use the NLP library. That was really phenomenal for getting like language detection, language negotiation between the sources and the contents. Um, we use tons of the string libraries to like strip out and process data across the fields that we were getting. Uh, and Scrapey itself has tons of plugins. So it has like a CSS selector plugin that we made use of. We did not use the XPath, but you could if you want. And it also has all these plugins for like the sources. So there's like HTML plugins or XML. Uh, there's even like Markdown and things that you can get. Uh, so we specifically made use of the HTML one there, but there, there's a whole host of ones that you can take advantage of. Uh, so it's really fascinating. You said um, uh, you don't recommend uh, the like the separate server for uh, Elasticsearch. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering what are the considerations because uh, we're using the uh, decoupled approach mm -hmm. uh, uh, with Reactive Search library, yeah. and uh, uh, Elasticsearch sits on a, a SaaS solution mm -hmm. on the cloud platform, yep. and it works like really well. So I was uh, like wondering what are what are the considerations? Why? <laughs> Uh, so considerations like self-hosting versus using SaaS, is that, is that the question? Yeah, you said uh, like the separate server for Elasticsearch, you don't really recommend that. Oh, uh, sorry. So uh, maybe I wasn't clear on that. So when I'm talking about a separate server, I'm actually just talking about separating it from like a source. So and sometimes like you might pay for say like a Pantheon host or an Acquia host and it's got a solar index that comes with it. Right? Uh, you need to make sure that that is separate from your, say, Drupal database or your Drupal web server or something like that because you don't want to slow it down. Right? So make sure that those architecturally are split up. So you want one central server. Uh, and, and that makes sense across federated, right? Because if you're federating across two, 3,000 websites, you can't park it in one place that's tied to one website. You should really put it somewhere completely separate in a central location. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anything else? No? Thank you so much.